<laughs> All right, okay. good morning again. Yes, okay. Esther's story. I'm actually very excited about this talk because this one has changed within the last few months and changed substantially only because I made what I believe to be a major discovery in what Esther is up to when she is a queen. <laughs> Esther, I believe, actually now has a hidden agenda uh, which I had not seen before, which I, I'll put the evidence in front of you and you decide whether it's true or not. And it's well beyond everything we've seen within the current story. It also ties in very nicely with the life of King Saul, for which uh, Brother Steve's class could not have been a better introduction. So I thank him for sacrificing his class in order to provide an introduction to mine. <laughs> well, sorry. Stop it. Let's start with a, a little interesting problem. It's, um, the book of Esther does not mention God, at least does not mention the name of God. And therefore, many academics uh, would complain that it doesn't actually belong in the Bible. Our community tends to receive the biblical canon uh, and take it as received, which I think is sound. Um, but just in case you're involved in an argument with someone who might say, well, Esther isn't really part of the Bible anyway because it doesn't even mention God, so how can you assume it's part of the Bible? It doesn't mention God by name, but the elements of faith in God and godliness per se are pervasive. Let's just talk through the entire book of Esther very quickly on one slide, and we can see that. Mordecai adopts Esther, his niece, or perhaps cousin, because she's an orphan, which shows the element of compassion. Mordecai helps Esther by telling her, look, don't reveal your Jewish nationality. Remain hidden as a Jew, it will cause you trouble. He's offering her protection in that matter. Uh, Mordecai refuses to bow uh, to the evil uh, Haman when Haman gets a law passed that everyone needs to bow to him. So Mordecai shows courage, and the reason he doesn't bow to him isn't just animosity, it's the fact that Mordecai bows essentially to God and not to man. And Mordecai pleads for God's people. He goes to Esther, what by the time Esther has become queen and is, a, is in a position of influence, and asks her, begs her really, to use that influence for the good of God's people. That shows empathy that Mordecai has with God's people. Then we come to the center of the book. Esther, before she goes to the king, because it will possibly cost her her life, there's a death sentence for what she's about to do. Um, so she directs a fast uh, for her protection. She says, I'm going to fast three days and three nights. Please fast with me. Now, that means she must believe in a God. There's no point in fasting otherwise. There's, there's no scientific reason that a hungry person is more likely to have their life spared than one who isn't, right? You're only fasting if you are appealing to a higher power. So that in itself gives good evidence that Esther has faith in God. Uh, she must believe in God to do that. And her next act is actually one of courageous sacrifice. She follows through and risks her life to save God's people. And that is the actual explicit work of Messiah. That is what Jesus will do. He will risk, and not only risk, actually end up giving his life, literally and physically, in order to save God's people. So Esther couldn't be closer to the role of Messiah than any of these magnificent leading ladies we've considered so far. And as the book continues, Esther pleads for God's people before the king, which is also that same empathy. Esther again risks her life because it turns out for complicated reasons she has to go before the king twice because the first time the king gets distracted by something entirely involved in his own ego and he forgets entirely what Esther has done and Esther has to repeat the process over again. And she requests Purim, which is the idea that the Jews should be allowed to avenge themselves on those who are planning to kill them. Uh, which shows courage to risk her life again uh, she requests a second day of Purim to further protect the people uh, that she loves, her people, God's people, um, from their enemies. And finally, Mordecai legislates that Purim should be ongoing as a day of celebration without the elements of warfare and killing, but those who should give presents for the care of the poor. Uh, compassion, therefore. And throughout that um, entire script, 
we also see not only uh, elements of God's character and also necessarily a faith in God and works deriving from that faith, but also clearly um, a common motif of being concerned with salvation of the Jews. So this is a slide that I have in my head that just says if someone tells me the book of Esther doesn't mention the, the name of God, I'm just thinking of that and says, I don't care if the name is there, it's imprinted, the presence of God in his character and in those trying to fulfill his will is implanted all over the place. The book is also written as a chiasm. I'm grateful to Brother Kidd, who has explained to uh, many of you who were who was in the room uh, when you were here for that evening presentation, what a chiasm is. Is anyone unfamiliar with the word chiasm? Is it a bit new or strange to anyone? Yeah, okay, fair enough. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I put it to you, you all know what a chiasm is, even if you haven't met the word before. Uh, you can see one. Look, I'll show you a picture of one. There's a chiasm right there. There's ten people in that photograph, and I'm going to tell you that two of those ten people on that day are more important than all the others. And you know which two. You don't even know those people. You've never seen those people before. And two of them are more important. You know which two. Why? Because your brain knows how chiasm works. And that's what allows you to know who the important people is. And the chiasm specifically is to create a sort of anti-symmetry that leads up to and emphasizes whatever's going on in the middle. So we have four uh, females, four ladies on the left-hand side here, uh, contrasted by four males on the right, and they've been made as identical as possible in order to make them sort of homogenized and of lower uh, import. We have uh, modifications of their dress sense. So the groom's dress is actually different from the dress code of his uh, of his groomsmen, ever so slightly, they've got the cornflower blue tie, he's got a white bow tie, and the color of the jacket's a bit different. And the bride's maids are in a lovely cornflower blue uh, dress, whilst the bride is strikingly different in white. And beyond that, once you've selected your, your known best man and, and uh, maid of honor, you can even arrange the people, as is often done, in order of height to present this sort of visual crescendo. What's the whole point? The whole point is to emphasize what's in the middle. Why do it like that? Because it's elegant. You don't have to tell people, by the way, it's his day and her day. You don't have to be clumsy like that. The presentation itself announces without words who the important people are. And there's an extra subtlety in the sense that the groom's dress code differs from his groomsman only slightly. You might even struggle to spot the groom if you saw the guys from behind. Whereas the bride's dress code differs most strikingly and most markedly from that of her bridesmaids, suggesting that even within the bridal couple, uh, there is one more important than the other on this day. And this day in our culture is generally recognized it is the bride's day. And everyone at the wedding will know that the whole day is centered on the bride. Everyone, with one curious exception, the bride's mother, <laughs> <laughs> But that mystery is far too deep for our explanation. <laughs> we're we're going to leave that in the land of mystery where it belongs. So, <laughs> so, now, can you see the wedding party here? Can you see the chiasm? There it is, you see, you have compassion and protection and courage and empathy coming in from the front towards the middle. You have compassion, protection, courage and empathy coming in uh, from the end towards the middle. All of the Mordecai's on this side, it'd be nice to have four Esthers, but you've got to run with what you got. And, and almost four Esthers on this side, uh, uh, applying that lovely counterbalance. What does that tell you? It's not just messing it up with words for the sake of it. The whole point is, just running the book of Esther that way says, that's the bit that matters most. The bridal couple of this particular picture, if you like, is Esther's faith in God married to the works from that faith, the courageous sacrifice she makes. That's the bridal couple, Esther's faith and works. Isn't that beautiful? You can get to James chapter 2, but he'll start telling you about how faith without works is dead, and faith must have works, and they marry together, and you're like, that's great, but I don't need to be told that. I've already read the book of Esther, and I've learned that through the very subtle and quiet and yet powerful way in which that is presented. Who is Esther? Esther is the hidden one for a, at 
there's a certain amount of wordplay here, and it sounds clumsy, but it's quite simple. Her Jewish name is Hadassah, which means myrtle tree, but she's renamed Esther. She's named Esther by her captors. They tend to rename uh, their captive audience. And that in Persian, or in the ancient Persian, uh, Esther means star. Now, as it happens, Esther, that word also has a meaning in Hebrew. Not that the Persians would necessarily know that or care. It happens to mean hidden. So Esther is the hidden one in Jewish, even though they've tried to call her star. And what's hidden, of course, is her Jewish nature. She's been told by Mordecai for her own safety to conceal that. And in, as a Jew, she is, in fact, the myrtle tree. As a brief aside, it's quite possible that uh, Esther, both Esther and Mordecai, are actually named after Babylonian gods, Ishtar and Marduk. I think that likely. You might say, well, surely it was the Persian kingdom? And that's kind of the point. It, it would have amused the Persians who overthrew the Babylonians to name their slaves after the Babylonian gods, thus further belittling the ones that they'd overthrown. It doesn't matter too much, but that's just an interesting aside. But what's more important is where the myrtle tree is in scripture. Basically nowhere with any importance except here at the beginning of Zechariah. The angel of the Lord was standing even concealed in the Hebrew. The angel of the Lord was hidden among the myrtle trees. And he is the one who cried out, I am exceedingly jealous and zealous indeed for Jerusalem and for Zion. So hidden in Esther, which word means hidden, is that she's Jewish. She's Hadassah, the myrtle tree. And hidden Esther in the myrtles, Hadassah, is the angel who is zealous for Jerusalem. It's a bit of a mouthful, that isn't it? But if you can grasp the concept, the words are as clumsy as they sound, but if you can just see the concepts, that's really rather beautiful. Uh, and it's going to come out with uh, good meaning uh, in the story of Esther. Let's get into the narrative then. The king, who's often called Ahasuerus, I'm going to call him Xerxes, which was the Persian word for it. It emphasizes that Esther was in a foreign land. Xerxes promoted Haman the Agagite and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. So Haman now, who was an evil man, uh, becomes the second in command in the land. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman. That is indeed a law which was written by the king. I have a sneaking suspicion it may have been suggested by Haman, but that would be a rather uh, sort of characteristic thing for him to su suggest as a law. For the king had so commanded concerning Haman, but Mordecai did not bow down. Mordecai did not pay respect to the evil man Haman. Unsurprisingly, this bruising of Haman's mm. ego causes basically rage. When Haman saw that Mordecai wouldn't bow down to him, Haman was filled with fury. So he sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. <laughs> Think about the depth of that psychopathy. That is a genuine sociopath. Are you going to call Haman anti-Semitic? The scary thing is he isn't even anti-Semitic. If Mordecai had been Brazilian, He'd want to kill all the Brazilians. That's how scary Haman is. What nationality is he? Whatever it is, wipe them out. That is hate on a quite unprecedented scale. He is an extremely unusual and scary man. He wants to kill all the Jews, not even because he's anti-Semitic, but just because one man who won't bow to him, one man who's insulted his ego, happens to be that nationality, that ethnicity, and therefore that entire type, that entire human species, if you will, uh, must be done away. So Haman said to King Xerxes, if it pleases the king, let a decree be issued to destroy the Jews. And the king said to Haman, and this is very typical of this king, we're not going to study him today, but he's actually a very laissez-faire king. He's interested in getting drunk and having a good time, and whatever the law becomes, he doesn't really care. And so everyone around him is able to manipulate him quite easily. So the king said to Haman, do with the people as you please. So the royal secretaries wrote out all Haman's orders. And what the king had done that was especially foolish 
is he given Haman his ring. His, and remember, from the time of Judah, your ring is your signature. Today we just use our handwriting, but it was the ring that actually made the signature. And they, therefore, the order to destroy the genocidal pogrom, you might call it, to destroy all the Jews, was written in the name of King Xerxes himself and sealed with his own ring. Why is that specially important in the time of the Medes and Persians? Because it cannot be repealed, it cannot be broken. It's a law that cannot be overthrown. No document written in the king's name and sealed with his ring can be revoked. It says the same thing uh, in the book of Daniel. When the Medes are in power, now the Persians are in power. Same deal. Okay. So it is now incurably and irrevocably written in law, the Jews will be destroyed. And so this is a, a panic situation, it's a crisis situation. So Mordecai tells Hathak to instruct Esther to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and to plead with the king for the Jewish people. But there's a risk involved that Mordecai may or may not know about. Uh, and that is that if the king has not requested someone, then it is a death sentence to appear before him, unless he happens to choose to override it by showing his scepter. And so Esther says, well, you're going to cost me my life to do this. And Mordecai replies, do not think that because you're in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. Mordecai has a belief in God. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows whether you have come to your royal position for a time such as this. So Mordecai essentially says, you as a Jew, your life is also at risk here. Personally, I believe Mordecai is wrong. Xerxes the king is so irrational. He's got this beautiful bride. And if the law says she should die, but he doesn't want her to, I'm, he'd make an exception. Nevertheless, everything else Mordecai says is spot on, isn't it? Either way, the Jews are set to be destroyed. This is your responsibility now, from the position you're in. From the position, he says, essentially, that God has put you in. And so then, let's look at our leading lady and see how we have a sturdy and courage. Here's the law. Any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the golden scepter to them. That's the law. Esther, do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. <coughs> Esther has faith in God. She's had encouragement, stern encouragement from Mordecai, but now her faith in God comes to the fore. And it's easy to talk about these things in a comfortable sort of air-conditioned auditorium, but she really, really did put her life on the line. And, and, and quite a life. She's a queen. She has a very luxurious life. There's a lot to lose. To be killed from a position of that is to lose a great deal. When this is done, when the fast is done, I will go to the king, even though it's against the law. And this beautiful, powerful quote, and if I perish, I perish. There's Messiah. I will sacrifice myself. This, essentially, is spoken in a place called Susa. But you'll understand what I mean when I tell you this is Gethsemane. Here is Esther in Gethsemane, without an angel to strengthen her, or so it seemed, saying, not my will, but God's be done. And if I perish, I perish. And she submits herself to God's law in the same way that the Lord Jesus did. And God has a different future for Esther than he does for his son. But neither of them would have known it at the time. She shows her courage and her ability and willingness to self-sacrifice, and God grants her the victory. When the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out to her the golden scepter that was in his hand. And her life is spared. God grants victory to the courageous sacrifice that comes from her faith in God. Now remember where we are. We're in Esther's chapter 4 and 5. Now there's 10 chapters in the book of Esther. Where are we then? We're in the middle. Now remember the wedding picture? This is the spiritually most important point. 
That's why it's written as a chiasm. Because most stories, the most important point comes at the end. We, we call it a punchline. But if the most important bit is in the middle, it's nice to arrange the story as a chiasm to remind you this is the most important bit. So spiritually speaking, let's take a moment to stay here and look again at Esther's courage and look at how it might inspire us. If Mordecai can inspire Esther with stern words, surely Esther's courage can inspire us. Esther approaches King Xerxes. The king has forbidden his approach, forbidden it by death. I'm not going to write out the verses. They just noted that. Who is Xerxes or Ahasuerus the king? He is a man who enjoys partying. He likes to get drunk. And, whilst drunk, he has been known to rage and tantrum when he doesn't get his way. He is self-absorbed and manipulable. In fact, even on this first occasion, when, he, when Esther comes before him to plead for the Jews, because of a misunderstanding of what Haman's doing with Esther, he thinks, and the king thinks that Haman's going to sexually assault Esther, he forgets all about the Jews, because he's too, too busy worrying about his own situation. And he's very easily manipulated. He's been manipulated by Haman to writing into law that the Jews must be destroyed. And he punishes other people when he's in fear. When he fears that the actions of Vashti, who refused to uh, accede to his drunken demands, when he fears that Vashti might destabilize the kingdom by allowing this, this selfish hold that all the men have over their women, when a woman actually speaks back to a man, he punishes Vashti. He punishes others when in fear. Esther shows huge courage to approach the throne of Xerxes. We know this. Now, how is that relevant to you and me? To whom do we approach as king? We approach King Jesus. And yet, we're sometimes we're reluctant to do so. We're sometimes afraid to do so by reason of feeling unworthy by reason of very really being unworthy. We have fears. Sometimes we are lazy, can't be bothered. We'll deal with uh, approaching Jesus later. Is this the same king? Xerxes forbids approach to him. King Jesus enables a confident approach, has torn down the veil, has torn down any separation that could exist between us and him. He invites us to walk boldly into his presence, something which we absolutely do not deserve, and yet something which he invites us to do. Who is Jesus the king compared to Xerxes? Is Jesus also someone who is drunken and rage-filled? He is calm, sober, humble, and godlike. We can read that here, but you know this, so I'll just put the, the verses up. He's not self-absorbed and manipulable. He judges impartially and righteously. He doesn't punish others when he's in fear. He rules instead by justice and mercy. And so the slide starts becoming very challenging when we write down, how can I possibly be slow or afraid to approach the throne of Christ when I, all I'm requiring is 1,000 one ten thousandth of the courage that Esther had to approach the throne of Xerxes. And Esther is motivated to approach the throne of Xerxes because she's pleading for someone else's salvation. And all I have to do for my own salvation is walk towards a king who wants me to do that in the first place. And I feel much enabled by the actions of Queen Esther to approach my law, which I might not have done before. Esther's courage compels us to the throne of Christ. We could stop there. It would be, this is a great closing slide. And I have no apology for putting this closing slide right in the middle of the talk, because that's where the spiritual focal point actually is, hence Caius. The story, as it happens, continues, and so will we. So Esther pleads for God's people. What is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. What is your request? Even to half my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. 
Why is he offering half the kingdom? Even he must be tremendously impressed that she has risked her life to come into his presence. Esther falls at the king's feet and weeps and pleads with him to avert the evil plan of Haman, the Agagite, and plot and the plot that he devised against the Jews. We've been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, killed, annihilated. How can I bear to see the calamity that is coming to my people? And the king is energized and angry. Who is he and where is he who has dared to do this? He actually should know, of course, but again, he's a sort of a drunken playboy, so he's not really paying attention to what's going on in his own kingdom. A foe and enemy, says Esther, this wicked Haman. And at that point, Esther, from a position of weakness, i.e. a woman, a queen, who is, does not equal, have equal rights with the king, who's not even allowed to come into the presence of the king, who's lower in status than Haman, who's been uh, elevated amongst everyone, has outmaneuvered her more powerful counterpart, and they hanged Haman on the very gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. So Haman is killed. The enemy is killed. If it pleases the king, said Esther, let an order be written overruling the dispatches that Haman devised and wrote to destroy the Jews. Do you see what Esther is requesting? She's requesting that the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be overturned, be overturned. She's literally requesting the impossible. But given that she is born to rule, or so I claim, she achieves it. That was never made clear to me. It's so obvious from the text. But it was never taught to me in Sunday school. In fact, the law of the Medes and Persians, Persians which cannot be changed, was often used as a phrase, usually for humorous purposes. Uh, many a time it was uh, invoked to, for the inviolability of bedtime when I was a kid. I'm sorry, the law of the Medes and Persians. Off. And I was thus dismissed. The whole says the king to Esther, you may write as you please with regard to the Jews in the name of the, in the, name of the king and seal it with the king's ring. For an edict written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's ring cannot be revoked, says Xerxes, stupidly, since what's about to be written is about to just do what he said cannot be done. He's not the smartest to the chef. <laughs> Esther has repealed the law which cannot be repealed. Realize that for monarchs in history, this is an unprecedented level of power. This has not happened before, it has not happened since. We don't have legal systems since that have rulings that cannot be repealed. And perhaps this is why. Because man may make these many proud pronouncements, but they're not actually true. You, you hear of those, uh, those kings that are so powerful that they have the power of life and death. No, they don't. They have the power of death. They can kill any living person they want, but if they take a dead person that they love, they don't have the power of life. Only Jesus has the power of life and death. Men say many proud and stupid things. Esther has repealed the law which cannot be repealed. Let's have a look then at how this uh, pertains to her name because now the law of Purim comes in and her law of Purim is that even though Haman was building up all the citizens in Susa and the provinces to get together, and if you hate the Jews, just get out there, kill them, and steal their, and steal their property. Esther has reversed that and said, okay, we'll have that same day, we're going to use that same day, and now the Jews are allowed to assemble against those who are planning to kill them, and kill them, and take their property. The hidden name was Hadassah, and who was zealous for Jerusalem. The angel of the Lord stood among Hadassah, and said, I am jealous for Jerusalem. This is a prophecy of Esther, spiritually speaking. The king allowed the Jews who were in every city to gather and defend their lives, to destroy, kill, and annihilate any armed force of any people or province that might attack them. So Hadassah, Esther, hidden, the hidden name, becomes the angel whose zeal saved Zion. And all of that was actually encoded in her very name to start with. How magical is that? And here's what's more, and here's what I've found since then. Esther, whose name means hidden, 
actually has a hidden agenda. I mean, can you believe it? I mean, she's, she's queen, right? And there's this evil man, more powerful than she is, even as queen, who has written in law, a law that cannot be altered, a genocidal pogrom to wipe out her people. Oh yeah, she dealt with that by last Thursday. Now, now she's going to do what she wants. Now she's going to do more, which is absolutely astonishing. And it all has to do with King Saul. Saul is of the tribe of Benjamin. Indeed, he's from the house of Kish, the son of Kish, in fact. And he is um, a monarch. He is the very first king of Israel, as we know. Queen Esther is also of the tribe of Benjamin, as told to us in chapter 2. Mordecai, the son of Jer, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his niece. So, in actual fact, hang on a minute. Esther's not just of the tribe of Benjamin. She's of the house of Kish. She's a descendant of King Saul. And I think this is very meaningful to her. Because she has to keep her nationality, her ethnicity, hidden. And, but the problem with <coughs> Esther is a direct descendant of Saul. And that's not all good news, though, is it? Every king of Judah, let's focus on the, the godly king and not the other one of ten tribes. Every single king of Judah was David and David's line. They're all Davidic, they're all from the tribe of Judah, with one exception, the first one, Saul, who's from the tribe of Benjamin. We know this. Here's the problem. Benjamin became a huge embarrassment because Saul was a total failure. Everything Saul did failed. His very first opening story that, that Steve considered, he's off going around the countryside chasing donkeys. <laughs> he's been out three days. He doesn't even catch the donkeys. <laughs> he doesn't think to go to the prophet. His servant does. After three days, the servant's tired of it. He's like, should we just ask the prophet? Oh, yeah, good idea, says Saul. <laughs> and they toddle off and go ask the prophet. And Saul's like, well, I've been three days in the countryside catching, well, I mean, these, these donkeys are completely uncatchable. And the first thing the prophet says is, no, mate, someone else has already caught them. <laughs> I mean, how useless are you? And I'm not trying to make comedy out of it, but, but that is how Saul is introduced. Unfortunately, Saul is a failure. In the little things, catching donkeys, but ultimately in the biggest things. The biggest thing of all being uh, the excellent class we've already heard this morning. Go attack the Amalekites, Kill King Agag, do not take the plunder, fail, 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 fail. And that's the final failure where God says, that's enough. No more of you as king. And he's banished, exiled from the throne, as it were. He's a failure. That's Esther's ancestor 500 years ago. Okay. I think Esther's very aware of this. And I think Esther has a wonderful godly character, and we'll see how this comes up. Thus says God, via the voice of Samuel, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Go and attack Amalek, and utterly destroy all that they have, but Saul and the people spared Agag. Now that's Agag, and he dies in that chapter, as uh, Steve showed us, Samuel hacks him in pieces. But, he comes back. He comes back later in the scriptures. Where is he? <laughs> Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Bible needs to tell us, is a descendant of Agag. It's not just that Esther's a descendant of King Saul. Haman is a descendant of King Agag. You realize what you're looking at? This is rematch. 500 years later, Esther kills Agag. Esther kills the Agagite. The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman, so they hang Haman on the gallows that he prepared for Mordecai. Why? Because in this context, with Esther being from the tribe of Benjamin, from the house of Kish, Esther recompenses for Saul. I think that's what's motivating her. She wants to make up 
for the failings of King Saul so many years before. <coughs> Convinced? Not yet? There's more. Esther's Purim, remember that law, allowed them to take the plunder of their enemies. You may uh, revenge yourself on your enemies, those who are planning to kill you, during the day of Purim, and you may take the plunder. Did you notice? This is one thing I hadn't noticed for years. Did you notice? But they laid no hands on the plunder. Esther chapter 9, verse 10, okay, sure. But they laid no hands on the plunder, five verses later. But they laid no hands on the plunder. And I'm like, okay, fine, I got it. <laughs> you have to say it three times. And for years I've noticed it's like, really, this waste of text. Esther's a small book. It's not going to be a small book if you say everything three times. <laughs> <laughs> but apparently, this is so worth saying three times over. I think it's Brother Marvin who was looking at cases of, of words that are repeated over and over for emphasis. This doesn't quite qualify as what you were looking at. But within a very short space of time, just six verses, the same exact clause three times over. I had known for years it was important. No idea why. But within this motif, it's obvious why, isn't it? We saw it in Steve's class. King Saul took Agag's plunder when he shouldn't. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the plunder and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? That's why Esther has written the law of Purim, so that you can take the plunder and clearly give them direction that they don't. Esther recompenses for King Saul. She is trying to remove the disgrace from the house of Saul, from the house of Kish, from her own great, 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 XXX grandfather. The final act. <clears throat> At the end of the day of Purim, uh, the king comes up to Esther and says, is there anything else that you would like? Is there anything else I can do for you? And I kind of expect Esther to say no as you're reading the story the first time. But she doesn't. She said, yes, okay. If it pleases the king, please maybe have one more day of Purim. What else does she ask, ask for? If it pleases the king, let the ten sons of Haman be hanged on the gallows. Almost certainly impaled, actually, but it doesn't matter. And the ten sons of Haman were thus impaled. Now, here's something I didn't even realize as I wasn't reading very carefully. And I'm not sure whether you're, you've been as guilty as I am. Do you realize that when Esther asks for that, the ten sons of Haman are already dead? See, I figured she meant, you know, they're still out there after the first day of Purim. Go out there and focus on them and get them. Wipe out the Agagite line. No, no. They were all killed on the first day of Purim. They're already dead. So she's actually saying, if it pleases the king, please, one more day of Purim, plus the ten corpses of the sons of Haman that we already have, can we get them out of wherever they are and hang them up around the city? That's pretty brutal. You could, you, you'd be forgiven for reading this and saying, like, I know this is supposed to be the good guy, but that seems a bit much. That seems like she's got a little bit too bloodlusty. Why? Well, we know why, don't we? Because after death, Saul and his ten sons had their bodies displayed and pinned up. They cut off Saul's head, this is the Philistines, fastened his body to the wall of Beth Shan and the bodies of his sons. How many sons? Three. But years later, when David is trying to make good with the Gibeonites, he asks them, is there anything I can do for you? And the Gibeonites replied, let seven of Saul's sons, by now some of them are actually grandsons, be handed over to us, and we will impale them before the Lord at Gibeon. In total, therefore, Saul and three plus seven, ten sons, not a hundred and ten, ten sons are impaled uh, uh, around, have their bodies desecrated. It's a great indignity in that culture and this. And so Esther says, yes, I have killed the Agagite, I have not stolen the plunder, 
I have undone the sins of Saul as much as they could ever be undone 500 years later. I also wish to avenge the house of Saul. I wish to visit the indignities that were put on him on the one who was his enemy and caused his destruction. Esther avenges Saul's house. And at this point, some of you might be thinking, wait a minute, isn't there some rather important verse about vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay? Why then is Esther allowed to do this? In the simplest terms, I don't know, but I can see aspects of why it might be allowed. Mainly because Esther is not avenging herself. This isn't all about her. The whole, the whole of her life, she's doing things for other people. She's actually acting out a sense of love for her fallen, failing ancestor and trying to restore his house and avenge his house. But for whatever reason, God's in control. God allows her, without punishment or criticism, to take vengeance on Saul's behalf and the desecration done to his body and the bodies of his sons. This too, then, is an unprecedented level of power. Generally, God does reserve vengeance for himself. But for Queen Esther, because it's perhaps because it's motivated on someone else's behalf, he allows an exception. What an extraordinary character we have in Queen Esther. Let's just summarize what we've learned then as we go to our final slide. Here then are the monarchs of Benjamin. King Saul, who failed, and Queen Esther. I've labeled them the Alpha and the Omega, and I hope you understand why. Because they really are the very first monarch and the very last. All the monarchs of the kingdom of Israel, Judah, were David, and all of David's descendants were 21 in total or so. But their book ended by Benjamin. Benjamin supplies the first monarch, who failed. Benjamin supplies the last monarch, Queen Esther, who succeeded. King Saul failed to kill Agag. He took Agag's plunder when he shouldn't, and his body and the bodies of ten of his sons and grandsons were desecrated in death. Queen Esther knew about that. Hidden Esther in her character and in her soul was an affinity with her family, affinity with her tribe, Benjamin, affinity with her house, Kish, affinity with King Saul however much of a failure he may have been. She successfully killed the resurrected Agag, if you will. But she didn't take the Agagite plunder, even though it was allowed. And she ensured that it was Haman's body and ten of the bodies of his sons, or the bodies of his ten sons, that were desecrated in death. And God allows us, what is she doing? She removes the disgrace in the house of Saul. And Steve told you just a couple of hours ago, God waited 450 years for vengeance to be delivered upon Ammon. But when it was, Saul failed. Well, God waits. Let's hear the second half of that story. God waits 500 years, and then the failure of Saul is lifted. And Esther works to remove the disgrace from his house. And Saul, in a way, though long dead, is restored. Benjamin finally has a godly mind. In fact, dare we say, Benjamin now has two godly minds. Number one, Queen Esther. And number two, a restored, a redeemed King Saul. Redeemed by the words of the one who came later. Truly. This is a person who was born to 